Good morning. Um, before I do get started this morning, um, I would like to uh, go back to last week a little bit and, and say that if anybody did not see last week's uh, lesson by Brother Robert, uh, if you weren't here, if you haven't seen it, you really need to go on uh, either our Facebook page, which is Sanctuary Church of God, uh, or search Sanctuary Church of God in, on YouTube and, and watch that because uh, if you've never seen anybody uh, with an, an, an anointing of the Holy Spirit come down, uh, you did see that last week. So uh, for anyone uh, interested in, in the activities of the Holy Spirit, you do need to watch that from last week. Uh, I hope that he has got some left up here because uh, uh, there was a, a heavy anointing up here last week. Uh, I am going to start off by going back to Robert, uh, Robert's lesson last week a little bit uh, and get, hit the highlights because it is going to tie in with, uh, with my lesson today. Um, we've seen the works of, of Peter last week where he has come back and he is telling the, uh, the Jewish believers of what has taken place with Cornelius and, and the, the miracle of the Holy Spirit coming down on them just like it had them at Pentecost and that uh, this had opened up and uh, a whole new um, people to talk to and to spread the word because you know God was going to deal with uh, the Gentiles as well. Um, and, um, I know a, there's a, another thing in here that we, I seem like I see this every time I teach, but there's always one thing, and if you don't watch, you'll read over it very quickly, and you'll miss it. And there was one thing like that last week, and I, I do want to hit on that. Um, in verse 28 of last week, it said, Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world. If we stop right there, we can say, why did they throw that in there? Well, we'll see in today's lesson why that was important to put in there. And um, <clears throat> as I've mentioned, that's uh, very easy to look over and step aside, step over at with everything else that was going on and the, the spirit that, that Peter was teaching in, that's easy to step over. But... With today's lesson, uh, we will see why they found it necessary to put that in there. Uh, before we do this, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask His blessing upon this and the blessings of these re uh, a reading of His Word. And we will uh, uh, begin then. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you at this time, we want to give thanks for this day. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to... The to enter into your word. And Father, we just ask that you open our hearts and our minds, and Father, you'll just apply it to our lives, that as we walk out of here, we can use your word to go in and go into battle, Father. We just ask your presence here in a mighty way today, Father, that during the teaching hour and as Brother Albert comes before us. Father, we just ask that anointing upon each and every one that comes, and Father, we just ask that you allow us to be the light as we go out into the world. Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Today's, today's lesson, I looked at several different ways of approaching this, and I want to look at it as we are in a battle. Each one of us are in a battle uh, of some sort, but when I say that, you say, uh, I am not currently in a battle with anyone. It's not anybody that I you know, really want to argue with or fight with. How untrue. We seen last week how Peter come back and he said he had had this miraculous um, revelation of taking the word to the Gentiles. And he was preaching to the Gentiles and, they, and the Holy Spirit come upon them and they bowed down and, uh, and they accepted the Holy Spirit just like the Jewish believers had. And we come uh, to the point where the Jewish believers, they recognize this. So this is opening up a whole new world for them to go out and preach the word to and spread this word of the gospel to the four corners. Whenever that takes place, the battle begins. We're going to see today that Satan's going to rear his head and there is a spiritual battle going on. So 
that could be a lesson in itself. Remember, whenever you start preaching the Word, teaching the Word, Satan's going to rear his head and he's going to bite at you. Okay? So th that would be a whole other lesson. And we are going to hit on some of that today. But let's look and see what we got going on here. Now, I may do this a little different today. I may just read a lot of this. I may stop and dwell on some of it. Uh, but anyway, we'll, uh, we'll just see where the Holy Spirit takes us there. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now, about, this, about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Satan's rearing his head right off the bat. He says, Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it's during the days of the unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him into prison and, and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Now, I want to go into, uh, everyone knows that I have a penchant for, for history. There's a lot of history in this uh, lesson today. We always hear about Herod. And sometimes it's hard to keep our Herod straight. <laughs> so I want, I want to, I want to stretch, uh, uh, stress on this just a little bit. I'll give you a, a real quick history lesson here on the Herods. All right, we've got Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the one that was in power whenever the wise men came through, headed to uh, that beautiful star, looking for that star, and, and the king that was born. And they told him that today a, a child is born and he will be the king of the Jews. That is Herod the Great. He had amassed a huge um, area. He had all the Israeli area. Uh, he was ruler. That's why they call him the great. He was a, had a big area. Uh, he was a little cynical and most definitely, uh, well, he is a tyrant because he felt that with this uh, new king being born, it was going to put his job at risk. So he's the one that sent out the, the decree to have everyone under a certain age, all the young children under a certain age killed, the, the, the uh, male ch children. So, that is Herod the Great. Moves on to Herod Antipas, which is another one that raised his head. If you remember, he's the one that had John the Baptist beheaded. That brings us up to the one that we're talking about today, um, Herod Agrippa. The best way I can describe Herod Agrippa, if you had... Um, Someone in power today uh, like him, he would be like one of our Hollywood stars. He would have the paparazzi following around him. He was a rich playboy. He was spoiled, rotten. Uh, actually, he was lucky to be alive because the same genes that had Herod the Great was handed down to Antipas, and he wanted all of his children killed if he thought they were going to be a a threat to his throne. So his mother sent this Herod to Rome at an early age. He liked the Roman lifestyle. He picked up on it. Uh, he made good friends uh, in power. He run around with a lead. I'm not saying we, we all have some kind of star or starlet in mind that we think of that look like they're living the life. They've got it made. That was Herod Agrippa. He made friends with uh, Claudius. Uh, he came in to rule under Caligula. And from his time in Rome, he, he, he learned some very valuable lessons. He learned how to be a politician. During his time there, though, he got in debt. He had to, to leave. Uh, once he left uh, Caligula who was probably, if you've never studied anything on uh, the Roman culture, Caligula was one of the biggest tyrants and evil rulers they ever had. And he killed his own dad, which is <laughs> uh, what some of these guys were afraid of. But he was just ruthless. And if, has anyone saw the, um, the AD series? Caligula was, was the one that was wanting his statue put into the temple. So, we've got um, Herod now who is in power. 
And he has learned that if he keeps peace, everything runs well. And that is um, an essential whenever you're in a Roman power and you're in a province trying to take care of it. Uh, sort of like we, we have said, you know, keep quiet and don't uh, raise your head. You'll be better not heard than have the wrath of the Rome come down, come down upon you. So that's what he has learned. He said, if I keep these Jews happy, that's going to make my job a whole lot easier. So, uh, uh, like I mentioned with Caligula, he got in with, uh, this Herod got in with the Jewish leaders, and he put off Caligula long enough that the statue was never put in. So that made him, you know, somebody that the Jewish people could live with, the hierarchy of the Jews. So he has uh, got on her good side, and now he does other things that uh, gets them in his back pocket. He converts, at least for show, to Judaism so that he can uh, continue that front and keep in their good and keep the quiet in the Israeli province. After Caligula's death, uh, he had put uh, Herod into the northern section of Israel. Whenever Claudius comes in, he expands that to the entire Israeli section. So he is a man of power now. As I mentioned earlier, he had friends in high places and it has paid off for him. Now more than ever, he wants to continue this quiet in the Jewish province. So what does he do? do? He's got the Jewish leaders here that have um, entrusted him. And he's got to keep this quiet so he knows that these Jewish leaders do not like this new Christian uprising thing going on. So he raises his head. He takes out James. That's where we're at here. In the first two or three chapters of this, uh, or verses of this chapter, we see where... Satan raises his head and he takes out James. Now James is a whole other set of the, just like the Herods. This is James, the brother of John, not the half brother of Jesus, not James the less. This is the half brother. He is one of the inner circle, if you might say. A lot of times, whenever Jesus would pull, um, you might say his counsel out to the side, it was James, John, and Peter. This is one of them. So he is striking a blow to the, uh, the head of the church. But he wasn't done. Because what does he do? He takes Peter. In this first section here, we see that he takes Peter, and it's closing in on the Passover, and he says, I better watch what I'm doing here, because even though they are in my pocket, if I do something over one of these major holidays like this, I'm going to start an uprising. So, he takes Peter, and he puts him in a cell. Usually, uh, in a Roman prison, they will take two people. They'll take one soldier. They'll chain the, the prisoner to him, and they'll keep, have another keep watch. Here it says there's, there's a quaternion. In other words, there's four soldiers per shift. So, you've got 16 soldiers. They chain two to the prisoner. They have two standing watch. They change shifts every six hours. So you're covered 24 hours a day around the clock. You're chained to one on each side of you. So Peter's predicament here is pretty dire. And if we consider that, at, you know, our prisons today are pretty tough. But first of all, they, these prisons, most time they were subterranean, a lot of times underground with just a little bit of a, a hole at the top to see. Um, they uh, got the soldiers, they got them chained to them with shackles, one on each side, plus two more at the gate. That would be pretty tough. Okay? So, that brings us up to there. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. 
And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and said, on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did, and he said to him, Put on your garments and follow me. Now I want to stop right there because there's something there that uh, I do want to hit on there. If you did not notice, in the first three verses there, James was killed. Here we've got Peter who is in prison and an angel shows before him. What is the difference between the two? Why is this angel before Peter? Prayer. All right. You've got James who in the first three verses is killed and there's no mention of prayer. None whatsoever. You've got Peter here who says that people, people are praying fervently and the angel of the Lord appears. Prayer works. All right. Uh, I'm going to go on and I'll come back and hit on this some more. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by an angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. We know that Peter's seen, seen visions before, and he thinks he's in another one of those now. He says, when they uh, were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that led to the city, which opened to them on its own accord. And they went out and, were, and went down one street, and immediately, immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he, had, uh, when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced to Peter that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so, so they said, It is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking. When they opened the door, they saw him and were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and said, Go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. I'm going to go ahead and finish out, and then I'm going to go back and we'll hit this. Then, uh, as, as, it was, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they shall be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. I'm going to stop right there. Um, we're going to go back and look at this now. You got Peter in prison. Um, Let's consider, let's put ourselves in Peter's place today. We have trials, we have tribulations that we have to go through today, and sometimes we don't handle them like Peter does. What is Peter doing while he knows, I want to put this in your mind first, he knows that James has been killed. And just by as I like to say, coincidence, the Passover is at hand. So Herod put him in prison. How well would you sleep at night knowing that you're chained between two soldiers and there's two more guarding the door and knowing six hours later there's going to be somebody to take their place that's going to be fresh and awake and alert um, to keep eye over you? Knowing that if you do escape, that those soldiers have to face your fate. If you got five years in prison and a soldier lets you escape, guess what? That soldier gets your five years. 
We know now that whenever Herod put him in prison by Scripture, by putting the soldiers to death, that that's what he had planned for Peter. So, you've got Peter now. He goes down there, and what does he do? He goes to sleep. We say this all the time, but I sometimes wonder that we, if we as Christians truly believe Jesus was the Prince of Peace. Peter's in a win-win situation here. Either these people praying for me, which I don't know if he is, realizes, but I, I hope by this time he knows that people are praying. They can either turn him loose, some miracle will happen and he'll get out. Or best case scenario, Jesus, I'll see you in the morning. So he was asleep. And evidently he was sleeping well. Because a bright light comes into the cell. Get up. And the chains come off, and he's let out. So Peter, uh, at this time, you know, what, what's going on here? He just had this vision. He thinks that God is showing him another vision of something that's going to take place. What's all this meaning? And after he, we did not, doesn't realize until after he gets outside that this was an angel sent to free him. So he's on his way out. Uh, he goes out. We could count the miracles here. All right. The change. Uh, the first of all, the appearance of the the angel. The chains fell off. He get he tells him get up. He goes out, the gates open by themselves, he gets him outside the, the city walls. Miracle after miracle in, in this one little series here. So, Peter is free. All right? And we know uh, through these scriptures that um, the next day has, has come about and uh, these soldiers are killed. But during the night, Peter runs to one place that he knows he's got friends. Because he's not out of danger after he gets outside the city gates. I'm sure he hurriedly went to the place where these people gathered. Uh, a lot of people think that this is actually where the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper took place, uh, that they have gathered to the same house. They're in prayer. Now, let's look at the people praying for a, for a moment. Peter gets to the gate. He's knocking on it. And a servant girl named Rhoda, which means Rose, comes to the door. She doesn't open it, but just by hearing his voice, she, she's familiar with Peter. Just by hearing his voice, she runs back in and tells him, Hey, Peter's out there. There's a pretty good lesson in this here too because what do they say? They say, you are crazy. We know he's being guarded by uh, a quaternion of soldiers. He's in a prison. So, a lot of times whenever we go to prayer, are we like that? Because here we see that they have, it said they were fervently praying. They were earnestly. And if you look, this was along the same lines of a prayer that, that Jesus had in the garden where the blood was a fervent prayer. But they still did not believe that it was going to be answered truly. You've heard stories of people saying, uh, you know, that someone had passed away. I know, I think Brother, um, the school out there, Andrew Womack, his son, whenever his son was killed in a car wreck, him and his wife got ready. They prayed all the way there, and whenever the other son come out, and they said, you're not going to believe this, he raised up. He's alive. We knew that. 
These people, they didn't know that. <laughs> they, they did not believe that Peter was outside the gate. So, finally, they came to that conclusion, and Peter tells them to go, get, go tell James and the others. James here is a sort of a passing of the buck, you might say, or passing of the duties, um, because Peter had always stayed pretty close to uh, Jerusalem, that, the holy city area, uh, as, a, as a teacher. And we know that James, the half-brother of Jesus, actually takes this ministry over, and he grows it from there. And that's why he's, he's actually calling for him, because I don't know if you have picked up on this or not, but Acts is sort of broken down in two parts. Chapter 1 through 12, it's all about Peter. From today on, we're going to start hearing about Paul. Now, you will hear about Peter one more time in chapter 15, but other than that, we're done with Peter. And that's sort of... Uh, sort of hate that because through this study I've gained uh, another, a higher level of fascination with Peter and, and the way that the Holy Spirit worked with him. There's a lot of good examples in there. So, uh, but you can't go wrong with Paul neither, so that's where we're going next. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're graduating uh, up, you might say, but I have to say I have had a fascination with Peter through this. All right, let's continue on now just a little. Um, and he departed and went to another place. A lot of people think that he went to Antioch from here, and a lot of his teachings that we study about the miracles that Peter done, they think took place after this uh, because he became more of a traveling uh, minister, you might say. Um, and they think he started at Antioch from this point here. Um, so just another little tidbit of history there for you. And then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. We've read, read this. Uh, I like the way um, that, that Luke has a play on words here. No small stir. In other words, there's a great commotion. And this is where he actually puts um, the soldier's death. And then Herod went down to uh, um, Judea and Caesarea. Now, we're going to get into the other part that I said earlier that's going to tie them together, that one verse that ties uh, chapter 11 with chapter 12, where he said that there was going to be a famine. As I mentioned, it would be easy to look over that. Let's look here where that ties in. Now Herod had been very angry, angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aid their friend, and they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. These two uh, cities here, they were port cities. They were bustling uh, um, economic uh, places, but it all had to do with the shipping trade. They didn't have means for their food. Yeah, what came in on ships, but at those days, whenever someone grew, uh, less, uh, by me used to haul produce and selling produce, if you, back in these days, if you hauled cantaloupes, you know, from across the Mediterranean, by the time you got them to Tyre or Sidon, you could probably drink them, okay? So, uh, they had a hard time growing their own food with this, these cities. So that's why whenever he was angry with them, he went down there. That is God's providence at work, bringing Herod to this place. Because he is, uh, they need him, for food and he's mad at them but they get on his, uh, his personal age good side and let's see what they start doing with, um, with Herod as I mentioned earlier I told you that he was a playboy he liked that lifestyle 
He liked that attention. He liked the paparazzi, if you would say, I might say, following him around. So, how do you get on somebody like that's good side? You rub their ego. Okay? You rub their ego. And that's what's fixing to take place here. It says, so, on a day set by Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to him. Now, if you look at some of the other historical books here, um, Josephus, most especially, has the same account of this. A uh, few different variations of it uh, in it, but for all in all, it's pretty much the same thing. They said that the threads that he wore in his robe, as it's mentioned here, were silver. So, if you can imagine a long robe made of silver, and this was the first thing in the morning, and he positioned himself as the sun was coming up, that the very first lights hit him. So, you can imagine this silver robe, and you've got the people of Tyre and Sidon sitting in front of you, and the first light comes up, it hits this robe, and it, it's going to emit a glow. So what do they think? He's got to be a God. Look at the glow that is coming off this man. So, he likes this. Okay? And the people kept shouting, The voice of God, little g, and not a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. eaten by worms. Uh, most theologians here believe that he is actually consumed by round worms from the inside out. Got to be a horrible, horrible death. So, he stood before people who called him a god You've got somebody who has, as I mentioned earlier, uh, converted to Judaism in show, in ceremony, pomp and cir circumstance in order to get on the good side of them. He's been around them enough. He should have known. He should have seen that the God of the Jewish people was the true God. But he could not step over the threshold of selfishness. He could not step over that. And it consumed him. A warning there. We need to be able to step over that threshold of selfishness. We'll finish up now on the, on the passages. And ba uh, Barnabas and Saul, as I mentioned earlier, chapter 12 ends Peter. We see now the uh, insurgents of, of Saul, which would be Paul, uh, said uh, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, and when they fulfilled their ministry, they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. We see that moving on now. Uh, we see Paul coming to front, and he's going to go out and start his ministry. And the rest of, of uh, Acts will be dealing with Paul and his ministry. Looking back, what are some lessons that we gain from this lesson? How many of us live a life where we do not have chains? David's got some right here in front of him, uh, in front of him and Liz. We all have our chains. We are all uh, bound to something. Satan will try to bind you to anything that he can use against you. We know, uh, as we have mentioned at the beginning, that we are in a spiritual war. In fact, let me go ahead and read that. It's on the back of my Bible, easy to find, so... For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age. Ephesians 6.12 um, 
we are all in a battle. We are all chained to something that's got us bound and Satan's enjoying every second of it. Now, I do want to say this. One of these days, with fervent prayer, prayers of those around you, there is going to be a light that opens up in your room. And whenever that point comes along and the Holy Spirit is kicking you in the side and says, get up, you need to get up. Because what's going to take place then, if you will allow Him to instruct you, pull your bootstraps up, follow me, and He is going to take you. If you'll follow the uh, deliverer, He'll lead you out that gate to the city. If you would with me, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to have to put these on. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. I'll close with this. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever Peter was laying there and he was able to sleep, it was not because of what Peter had done. He knew he had already had that victory through Jesus Christ. As I mentioned earlier, it's a win-win situation for him. If I get out, I'm good. If not, I'm going to where Jesus told me and I'm going to meet him. If you remember, I told you earlier, the inner circle, James, John, and Peter, they were the ones, they were the ones saying, which of us is going to sit on the right-hand side? Christ told them, my father will decide who sits on my right side. So Peter had that promise. He said, oh, James is there. If I hurry up, I might be able to beat him to the right side. <laughs> so so, so we, we see that uh, uh, there is victory through Christ. There is no sin. There is no torment. Greater is he that is in us than he is that in the world. So if you truly believe that, the chains that are holding you back can fall to your side. Amen. Through prayer, through the help of the Holy Spirit, he will lead you out. Good stuff in this just chapter. As, as I mentioned, I sort of hate to go on. Uh, I hate leaving Peter behind now, but we'll go forward. And uh, if you would, I would like to say this for each of you that are, that are here. Uh, through the course of the rest of the study, pray for the anointing of, of the teachers on this. Because I, I know by being up here, uh, sometimes it's a struggle for me to see where God wants us to go with this. And if we believe that these people prayed for Peter and the chains fell off, you all do the same for us. Amen. Not just us, uh, do it for Brother Albert too. And I would like to see that uh, through, the, through the course of this and see you all take an active part in delivering this from up here. If you would. Thank you all. I ask that you be blessed and be a blessing. Thanks.